thank you everyone for being here because if you're here tonight, then we know that you really wanted to be here because it was not easy to get here. Some of you may, did anyone pay $100 for an Uber to get here? I heard some people did. Did anyone get stuck on the subway on the way here? Yeah. So if you're here, we know you really want to be here. And I'm hoping the reason you really want to be here is that you care about privacy on chain and security and data protection. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. We have an amazing lineup of speakers tonight. It's so high powered. You're going to see people that you've heard about, people that you've read about, you've watched videos for. And these people are here today because they care about confidential computing. So we're introducing a new term today, actually. It's kind of the debut of DCC, as we call it, Decentralized Confidential Computing. So keep your ears open for this term because just like DPIN is a big, big narrative right now, we're thinking that DCC is going to be the next big narrative and all the VCs are going to want to come and invest in DCC. Because what is blockchain without some confidentiality? It's just putting your whole life out there on the internet or on the, on the chain, which is not good. All right, well, we are going to bring up our moderator in a moment. Um, and before we do that, I want to just talk about the character and quality of our speakers today. Because all of them, while they're influencers, many, they're doing great things in the world, the work that they're doing is advancing the, the technology, uh, the blockchain technology for everybody. But personally, they are also doing things. They are helping terminally ill children. They are uh, running gyms for underprivileged kids. They're educating people about finance so that they can have a better life. These are people who care about other people and who are here in this space because of that big heart that they have. So I'm really excited to have our, all of our speakers today and really proud, actually, that, um, that they're here to talk about the concept of confidential computing. Now I'm going to introduce Wendy O, oh, who needs no introduction. Um, she will be moderating this first panel with, and I'll, I'll let you introduce your own panelists. So please come on up. And everybody, let's give her a big hand. <laughs> Welcome, Wendy. Can you hear me? Awesome, it works. OK, guys. So sorry, I was drinking some Coca-Cola because I needed a little bit of caffeine. I feel like everybody's tired, right? You guys feeling good? <gasps> yes, we awake? <laughs> Woo! OK, so we're going to be talking about the most sexy topic in crypto in Web3. So make sure you're prepared because it's going to be super exciting. Um, we're going to be talking about privacy, well, the importance of privacy in Web3. It's actually a very important topic that a lot of people don't pay enough attention to. I know on my content, anytime I talk about OPSEC or I talk about privacy, we don't get a whole lot of views. But the people that actually listen to it, they're the ones that are not clicking on random links. They've got their crypto custodied, and they've got a good idea of how to protect themselves online. So we're going to be doing this awesome panel. We have got. Who do we have today? We've got Tor from Stash.io. Give a round of applause. We have Gav, which is the, you're the CEO, right? You're CEO, founder, CEO of um, Wolf Financial. Give a round of applause. And last but not least, we have Andy. Andy is the author of NFT Zero to Hero, right? Awesome. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and pass this around. I want you guys to do a quick intro of yourself, um, just so the audience knows who you are and what you've built, and then we're going to get into the importance of privacy, especially in Web3. So if you'd like to get started, Andy. Oh, sure. Uh, I'm Andy Lian. I, I travel all the way to Singapore, uh, from Singapore to, uh, <laughs> to, to New York. Um, I am more known as an author. Uh, I'm also a licensed fund manager in Singapore. Um, I manage my own fund. Um, I invest in different projects as a VC. Um, other than that, I spend most of my time um, advising different governments, you know, about crypto regulations, about uh, the usage of blockchain, and, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of all, all this work uh, since 2018. Uh, that's, that's who I am. Thank you. 
Awesome. Thank you, because um, Singapore is actually leading the way when it comes to positive regulation in crypto. It's something we cover all the time. So thank you for your service. Gav? Hello, everybody. Hope you are having a great night. My name is Gav Blacksburg. I'm the CEO of Wolf Financial. We are a media marketing conglomerate. We have several branches. We host about 50 hours of Live Spaces content every week across our brands. And the goal is to educate and help people build their financial literacy and ultimately generational wealth. We got Tor. Uh, I'm Tor, I'm CEO and co-founder of Stash. Stash built the first marketplace, maybe still the only marketplace, for encrypted NFTs, which have privacy by default. We might get a chance to talk about what that actually means for NFTs, why it makes them more than just like pictures on a blockchain. You know, it's like they can actually be extremely powerful primitives, but only if you have privacy at the foundation. So privacy unlocks a lot of stuff for us. And I think that it's going to unlock a lot more for Web3 in the coming months and years. Awesome. Yeah, I would actually definitely like to learn a little bit more about that because I love NFTs and I love ordinals because it's basically ownership, just like of a particular item, where regardless it's tangible or not tangible, just like Bitcoin is ownership of your own money. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about what privacy means to each and every one of you because some of you guys come from the traditional world, Web2, traditional finance. I'm more of like a crypto person, so... Privacy, to me, is going to be very different than it is to you. So if you want to start, Andy. Privacy, to me, is about not letting other people know what I don't want to let them see. You know, that's, that's, what, that, that's what I look at it. You know? and, and whenever people talk, tell me about privacy, for example, the Web2 guys, you know, they, they, they would think that whatever that we are trying to do on-chain, you know, all these things are in the public. You know, and then when I speak to the government, you know, then they start to question me about private blockchains, for example, and and it's 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 kind of it's kind of annoying, you know, to be honest. But but if they really understand, you know, what 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 privacy means to them, you know, as an organization, they will realize that there's actually a lot of different boundaries, you know. So I think it's all about boundaries and how you re you relate to all these boundaries, you know. That that's what privacy means to me, you know. Yeah. yeah, that's great. To me, it is about knowledge and options, right? And I won't go too far into it because I know we're going to get deeper into this, but I come from that traditional finance background, working at Goldman Sachs, working in corporations, and seeing a little bit from the internals, and I had to get out. I'm seeing what's happening with these corporations, right? I go and make a website on GoDaddy for the next three weeks. I'm getting spammed to my text message, to my emails, because my information has been sold the, click, the second I click buy, right? And for me, all I want to know is a couple things. One, is my information going to get sold? If so, to who? Where is it going? And then number two, the option to say, should it or should it not be? And if it should, I'd like to benefit. Tor. Yeah, the, the Web 2 world is no good for privacy. We lost a lot of battles. Um, somehow the Web 3 world is worse. You don't have to wait for a middleman to show up and sell all your data. Anybody can go to Etherscan or SoulScan or what have you, and it's already there. Like, don't, don't even bother waiting for GoDaddy to sell it off. Like, they can just go scrape it right now. Um, that is not great for data privacy and protection. It's also not great for the value of the data. How valuable can it be if you're just giving it away for free on the blockchain. So for me, privacy is the key to unlocking value and protecting value in Web3 beyond just like the, the, the thing where it's like, I want the choice, I want to be able to consent to how data is used. We're also thinking that choice and consent is what unlocks value for the end user. And I think a lot of people in this room can understand value in crypto is what brings a lot of people to the space. They want to make sure they can secure that value and that extends to the data on the chain as well. So Tor, I actually just have a short question for you, and then yeah. we're gonna get to the next topic. The reason why I wanna ask you is because you're more, um, you're kind of deeper down that crypto Web3 rabbit hole. So we always hear the idea that crypto is bad and that um, it's done for illicit transactions and all those types of things, but really when you think about it, um, you can actually see everything. And no, even if you're using um, like a tornado cache or something like that, Mixer, doesn't matter what it is, but any of those stuff. You can, if you're good enough, you can still pretty much track it. There's, pe I know people that are able to track it. So why do you think we get so much pushback from the public servants and from people in the world assuming that crypto is for illicit things when it's literally all there? All the information is public with cash, it's not. 
Yeah, and it's a great point. Uh, some of it is an education issue, and it's been an education issue for years. They just assume it works a certain way because they've been told it works a certain way. These are the same senators who sit in Congress, and then Mark Zuckerberg comes in, and they ask him how Facebook even makes any money, and he has to explain their entire business model, even though it's been an active public company for over a decade. You know, this, this is not, uh, you know, I, I can't speak for other countries, right? In the U.S., some of our politicians are pushing 80 and 90, so... It's, it's a little tougher when it comes to technical education. But, you know, there, there's also this piece, you know, there's really well-intentioned public servants out there in every country, including in the U.S. Outside the education issue, it's like they really do want to protect consumers at the end of the day. So the challenge has been understanding how does privacy, protecting privacy in Web3, end up protecting consumers and end users. They may not see that very tangibly yet in the Web3 space because they don't even see how crypto in general, is benefiting the end user. You have public officials saying, we haven't seen a single use case for crypto. Well, until they stop saying that, they're not going to see the utility of privacy in crypto. So it's, it's kind of a staged education process. First, they have to see the value of the technology of financial empowerment. Then they need to see the importance of privacy to ensuring that this extends to every person, right? Especially people who might be marginalized, especially people who have been shut out by the existing systems. You know, it, it, it's going to take a while. It's a short question with a complex answer, but the, the short answer really is a lot of it is well-intentioned people who haven't gone nearly far enough down the rabbit hole to really understand the complexities. But let's not assume that they're malicious. They just really need the right people to show them the way. Really quickly, Andy. So when you're working with Singaporean regulators, how do you explain <laughs> that aspect of like public versus private when we're talking about blockchain technology to them? I, I think when we look at uh, the aspect of uh, privacy uh, or, or Web3, for example, you know why some of them are very much against uh, the Web3 privacy decentralization. You know, apart from what the, the, uh, Tom mentioned about uh, education, I think the other thing would be the conflict of interest, right? So wh whoever the politician or government is, uh, they may be funded by some of these private enterprises. You know, uh, maybe the private enterprises, which is a Web2 organization, they seem to be monopolizing certain aspects of the advertising network where, where they are already, already receiving all this, uh, you know, all this revenue or profits, you know. And since that's the case, you know, whenever some new technology, for example, like what we are trying to do, they tend to kind of block it, you know. So, so this is what I see, you know, when I do a lot of these inner workings with uh, different corporations. I, I can't mention which country, which corporation, but some of them really did voice out things like this, you know. And I, I think it's a very, very practical approach, you know, to be honest. All right, I kind of want to talk about Web 2 privacy versus Web 3 privacy. And I want to start with Gav because that's really the world that you come from, the background. So talk to us a little bit more about how traditional privacy, or maybe your opinion on traditional privacy has shifted since from Web 2, now that we're kind of have this thing called Web 3, crypto, blockchain, that's what, like 20 years new, old? I like to call it 20 years new. The lack of privacy is kind of like the rise of inflation. It's getting scary, and it is only speeding up. I saw a great tweet today uh, they were talking about. They said, here's what, if things continue to rise at, it'll look like in 40 years. Houses, $2 million. Daily, you know, average monthly rent, 10 k And privacy seems to be going the same way. 20 years ago, these weren't even thoughts people were having, right? The data was not on chain. It wasn't being sold like this. It wasn't commercialized. But we're getting to the point now where it's so common to have these crazy data hacks and to have companies actively, deliberately, selling our data, trying to hack it and target it. Just two weeks ago, Meta had a down day in the stock market because it was reported that Mark Zuckerberg ordered a special team to go hack Snapchat files to get regular people's data. They also, we were talking about it with Netflix, selling data right off to Netflix, private data. This has really sped up over the last 10 to 15 years. My concern is what's it going to look like in five to 10 more years when there's cameras everywhere, where every single piece of data is being collected on us, our biometrics, right? Our families, our habits, our hobbies. It hasn't gotten there just yet. So that's why I think we need to have these conversations now. And that's why 
I am so excited for the tracking of Web3 and for the privacy and the things that you were saying were blowing my mind over here. By the way, can I just say how nice it is being on panels with really smart people? I'm sitting up here just learning and listening. So that's my thoughts coming from Web2. It's crazy what I'm seeing happening and people are just not even blinking an eye at it because it's become so commonplace. Like, yeah, of course Mark Zuckerberg tried to hack our stuff, right? Like, that's Mark, you know? But like, no, that's not the way it should be. Tor, I kind of want to get your take on it because you're a privacy guy, right? You know a little bit about that. Yeah, I used to work at Snapchat. Okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, we boy. didn't hack anybody's files, guys. Come on. We delete all those photos, totally. Um, no, I mean, I, I come from a couple different backgrounds here. I started my career as a derivatives trader, so I was very finance heavy. And then after grad school, I ended up in big tech. I was, I was full-time at Snapchat on their data science team. I've seen exactly how Web2 uses data. It's not great. I don't want to talk too much publicly about how many plain text passwords I saw. Uh, but, you know, I've been out of there for a while. So who cares? You know, just don't have passwords. I don't know. What are you supposed to do? Um, don't put your private keys in, like, your iCloud. Don't do that. Um, no, Web2 privacy is, like, like I was saying, it's, it's not great and it's getting worse. But the reason it's getting worse is because that's where the money is, right? Like, there's, there's clearly value to the data. There's this weird pattern in with data, whether it's web two or web three, it's all internet. It's all it is very connected world. The funny thing is, is like individually our data is not very valuable. So we go and we try to sell our data on data marketplaces and then we discover it's worth a couple cents. But in aggregate, it's the most powerful thing in the world. So the most valuable companies in the world and some of the most valuable companies in web three have gotten very good at packaging processing all of this data. One of the most valuable companies in crypto is Chainalysis because they've built products around the repackaging and the reanalysis of data that's publicly available on chain. The data is just out there. It's already free. We already gave it away, but the valuable company knew what to do with it. The thing is, they know what to do with it, and so does North Korea, and so does everybody else. So yes, in Web2, we have a lot of very optimized monetization models around the use and the sharing of your data. Uh, you know, like selling your messages to Netflix isn't great. But there's, in Web3, the same models emerging, just with different winners that are also equally interested in regulatory capture, like uh, Andy was talking about, like, that is, that is the play, that is the process. It will work in Web3 the way that it worked in Web2, unless we provide alternatives. And those alternatives do have to be partially technological, but also there have to be businesses built on those strong privacy first foundations that are just as successful so that consumers have real choice because the consumer the consumers use the apps they don't use like AWS they're going to use the app so the apps have to make good choices no i totally agree with you andy i also would like to get your take on web2 privacy versus web3 privacy and how we can essentially create a different environment that fosters the want and the need for privacy. Because let's face it, most people in Web 2 could care less. People are just so busy just trying to get to work, providing for their families, and make a lot of mistakes. Um, my, my point of view is uh, more straightforward, very similar. I think Web 2 and Web 3, the kind, of, uh, um, the kind of issues that we have is not solved. You know, maybe we need a Web 4, you know, maybe, I'm not sure. You know, but but at, at this cu current point, the only, the only thing that when, when, when I speak to communities, for example, it, many of them came from a Web 2 environment, they switched to Web 3, and then we started to talk about data privacy, and then they told me this, as long as uh, I'm a Web 3 user, I get a cut from the, from the rev revenue stream, I, I, I'm, I'm a happy camper, you know? So, so I think there are many different schools of thoughts on how this can be avoided, but but I think f from a from a from a general standpoint, I think the issues are still the same. It's not solved at all. You know. That's how it is. All right. Well, I kind of want to because we got to wrap up soon. But I kind of want to talk a little bit about privacy versus security because I don't know. Sometimes when I hear <laughs> when I hear the word privacy, I'm like, okay, well, I'm safe. Like all my stuff is protected and I'm safe. But in reality, um, my opsec is actually um, not as good. <laughs> As I think it is, and I see Tor laughing at me, making fun of me. No, so, my OPSEC's terrible. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so um, we're gonna we're gonna toss it over to Tor, and then I know Gav's got a story he might want to share. Oh boy, I'm not gonna share a horror story, but I will talk about this difference between privacy and security, right? Like. 
privacy is like for a lot of people a luxury good. It's also priced like a luxury good. Whereas security is table stakes. You know, if your app is insecure, if your bridge gets hacked for multiple hundreds of millions of dollars, like that's a security issue, not a privacy issue. If you don't have security in the blockchain space, you lost all your money. Privacy is a protection issue. This is just about like being able to choose at some point in the future what you share and what you don't. The challenge, of course, is if something is public in the first place, it can never be private again. Something that is secured at one point could always become insecure in the future and then re-secured. It's a constant battle. Privacy once lost for a piece of information is not recoverable. So thinking about the importance of privacy and security in that way, like they're both critical, but think about how valuable it is to maintain security, to maintain privacy. Think about how unrecoverable it is once you lose it. And then I think you start to pick apart the issue a little bit better and understand like the importance of both, but that they're really separate but related issues in the space. Do you want to talk about, talk about it, Gav? Yeah, sure, and I think you hit on it so well. Privacy, at the end of the day, is fantastic to have, but losing it, clearly, we've seen with these corporations isn't going to stop people. Security is that end-all, be-all. And I had the uh, privilege of two weeks ago, for the first time ever, having my Twitter account hacked. Uh, very lovely experience, as you can imagine. Uh, posted, hey, we're launching Wolfcoin. Come, send your, you know, here's the wallet, send your pre-sale stuff. Uh, and, you know, that was just a simple thing that happened where essentially I got reached out to, really, really great job and props to that account for disguising themselves as a reporter for a very large company, right? I'm used to getting reached out to these things. I look through, this one seems to pass the check. I pull open the calendar to schedule. It says, hey, how would you like to you know, connect your Twitter to make this an easier experience? I'm not thinking I'm doing six things at once. I'm probably you know, deep in a Twitter space at the moment. I go, cool, let's get this on the calendar, right? A day later, all of a sudden, this tweet's getting put up and it's like, whoa, what happened here, right? I've been on this platform for years and years and years. Nothing like this has ever happened. So privacy is one area, but that wasn't even really an invasion of privacy, right? It was just a security piece there and it's the mindset. And the reason I just wanted to mention it is we are in Web3, right? We are talking here. These things are much more prevalent. The company that reached out to me was uh, frauding as a Web3 social media company. And I fell for it, right? And that's a learning lesson. And I just wanted to share it on stage in a privacy and security chat because my message is, if you get the DMs, don't click the Calendly link. Do not connect your social media accounts to anything. Do not give anyone access, any platforms. Go into your connected sessions after this meeting and remove all access to everything shady. That's what I got. revoke your contract permissions. Revoke, revoke, revoke. Andy, in closing, do you want to touch really quickly on quickly. privacy versus sure. security? I, I, I just want to sum up. I think most people will not understand. You need to suffer once, and you, and you learn the lesson real hard, and you, and, and you will never do it again. You know? It's just like, you know, if you look at my like, Telegram account, there's a lot of fake Andys. You know? So I tell my <laughs> friends, if, if, I'm, if I text you to ask you for two BNB, that's not me. You know? <laughs> Maybe a hundred, hundred BNB, maybe it's me, you know, but, <laughs> but, but, the th but the thing is, you really need to be careful, you know, so careful is the, the key word, thanks. Well, you guys, is actually, before we go, I know we're over, but I like to do what I want to do when I'm on stage. Really quickly, do we have any questions? Just at least, I'll take one question if there's any questions. No? No? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Oh no! That's, we all, that's a whole other. I was panel. about to say we could do another like seven hours. Okay, well I'll keep it super brief. I mean, like AI is already you know trained on everybody's data. Some of this is already too late, right? The LLMs were trained on artists' work for generative like digital art AI. LLMs have been trained on like Reddit data. So if you were a shit poster for years, sorry, you're already in Chat GPT. It's over. The question is, what happens next? Will the AI models of tomorrow? be held to a better standard you know when these things go they, they will all go to court they're already in court what will be the future of copyright protection for data what will be the future for your web3 data tbd but i think the future is more interesting to litigate the past we already lost well on that note <laughs> good news everyone 
the good news is is that um, you heard an awesome panel with really amazing people that were able to discuss privacy and security and all of the other important aspects that go with that. So there is hope for the future. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Wow. What an amazing panel. Okay.